really talking to my family, I sat them down one day and I said, okay, I'm going to describe what I do and tell me if it makes sense. And there were 10 of them. And after I finished my spiel, my, my elevator pitch, they looked at me and every one of them gave me a different answer. And I was like, elevator pitch is terrible. I need to fix this. <laughs> this is Therapist Clubhouse, a podcast for private practice entrepreneurs. I'm Annie Schusler. This week, I'm talking to Selma Bachivats, a private practice entrepreneur in Jacksonville, Florida. She's a therapist, of course, and also the host of the podcast Parent-Child Relationship Guru. Listen as she talks about serving families around trauma and attachment and creating a business that brings her profit and joy. Welcome, Selma. Thank you so much for being on Therapist Clubhouse. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So I'm excited to dive into your entrepreneurial journey. Can you tell us how long you've been in private practice? I started my private practice in August of 2014. So two and a half years now. I can't believe I can say that. Or is it more than that? Three and a half years. Three and a half. Years. I can't do math because we're in 2018. <laughs> but you know, that's very impressive. That's a short time considering how much you're out there and how much you're doing. So you specialize in helping children ages birth to 12 who have survived a traumatic event and also helping moms with perinatal mood disorders like postpartum depression. And you are the parent-child relationship guru. So am I getting that right so far? Yes. I'm actually very impressed that it's all working out that way. <laughs> I primarily focus on helping kids with attachment and trauma issues. And a lot of the time I see moms who have gone through, um, traumatic births or have had miscarriages or have had uh, postpartum anxiety or depression that's preventing them from really establishing that safe and secure connection with their children. Ah, and do you end up working with any adoptive families as well? I do. A lot of my clients are um, adoptive families. I would say 75% of my caseload is um, adoptive families. Oh, great. Um, yeah, one of my kids is an adoptee, so very great. And how did you choose your niche? I'm imagining there's, you know, a whole bunch of reasons, but what do you, how do you, how would you explain that now? I would say that it shows me, <laughs> mm -hmm. if I can say it this way. Yeah. I remember um, probably, and I can't believe I can say this now, uh, almost 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I graduated with my master's. And initially, I wanted to focus on working with victims of torture because I come from a country that experienced an ethnic cleansing, a war. And I really wanted to dive into that population and, and help. Mm. However, when I received my first internship, it was at a place where we provided counseling for victims of sexual abuse, primarily children under the age of 12. So when um, I, I kind of was pushed into that world, it opened up this unlimited, endless possibility of, you know, you can actually change a person's outcome when you're working with them this young. And um, I just fell in love with it. And then mm. fast forward, I don't know, maybe six years ago, my boss sent me to a training called an infant mental health training. And I was like, how do you do therapy with babies? Like this is, I really don't want to do this. But from the first moment of entering that training to the last meeting we had, and I am continuously involved with that population, I fell in love with helping young children, helping families overcome any obstacles that would prevent them from having a safe and secure attachment and bond. Mm, wow. So that's, that has a huge, profound impact. Absolutely. Yeah, so can you give an example of what kind of intervention might happen there? Are you referring to the infants and toddlers? Yeah, yeah. Interventions that I primarily use are dyadic. So I focus on the relationship between the parent and the child. How well is the parent able to meet the child's um, needs physically and emotionally? Uh, we talk about the parent's own trauma uh, issue or parenting trauma um, or attachment trauma, because all of us have experienced something that we kind of sit back and say, hmm, I'm not going to do 
this exact thing that my parents did to me. And this may leave an unresolved attachment trauma in us, which could prevent us from really caring um, and going into that deep connection with our child. So focusing on helping parents overcome this to help them make that connection with their children is a big part of my work. Mm. And I'm sure you probably get asked a lot about kind of the difficult side of this. Like, isn't it, isn't it really hard working with these kids? Isn't it heartbreaking? But I'm also, so I'm sure you've covered that a million times, but I'm also imagining that there must be some of the other side, a lot of the other side of getting to see things get better, getting to see families strength and then drawing strength from that. Would you say that happens for you? Absolutely. I would say that in <clears throat> most of my cases that occurs where the parent really starts understanding that a lot of the, the child's behavior problems or the ch- child's, um, excuse me, or the child's um, relationship problems or lack of school involvement on their end is caused by them really having some unexpected expectations of their child. Mm. So when the parent reaches that clarity and they understand how important they are in their child's development and how much their child needs them, that clarity gives that empowerment to the parent and they reach a much deeper understanding of what they need to do for their child. So a lot of the times when the parent is involved, that positive, that, that you feel good about this feeling comes up. Uh, comes about. Mm, Yeah. And what's your, so you've been working with these kids and these families for a long time. And I'm wondering, how do your clients find you? Primarily word of mouth, Mm -hmm. I would say at this point. I am listed in a few, well, actually one right now, Psychology Today, a searchable um, database. Mm -hmm. And um, Others are really referrals, word of mouth, or from agencies in in the area who know of my work and and, uh, readily send their clients over to me. Mm -hmm. And you also have a podcast. I do, yes. And so I'd love to hear about your business model. So I know know about the podcast. I know you do one-on-one sessions. Uh, Tell us about online family consultations and... DCF parenting classes and it's just anything else that you do. Mm-hmm. So my, my business model is really, um, again, everything I do is related to the trauma and attachment within the family or the child setting. The podcast is called Parent Child Relationship Podcast, and I have um, different experts in different areas of the parent child relationship come on and talk about attachment and talk about relationship between the parent and the child. I am trying to do more videos, blog videos for my website, but I haven't really gotten to that yet. Uh, But that's really a goal of mine in this upcoming year. What do you, for you, what do you think is um, stopping you sometimes from doing those videos? I would have to say the time commitment. Mm -hmm. Um, I could clone myself. That would be wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I can't. And I think uh, one thing that I'm learning or have started learning last year is that it's okay to outsource. It's okay to seek help in areas that you don't need, really need to be present for. So when I initially started my podcast, I would do everything. I would... um, edit the, the audio, I would, I would do the artwork, I would do the show notes, everything. And it would take a long time for this to get done. So I finally ended up finding a team of people who I just submit my file to, and they get everything taken care of for me. And it feels so good because it's done. And I just all I have to do is publish it. That must have taken hours off your plate. Um, I am not exaggerating when I say probably a good 24 to 32 hours off my plate. And this every was- week, every week. Yeah. Oh, wow. Selma, that's huge. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so with the videos, I am trying to come up with a concept that will not be time consuming for me, but that would be very beneficial to the families who are listening and watching, who can get a lot of very good um, information and resources and tips and tools from these videos to help their parent-child relationship. 
and the DCF classes are primarily parenting classes that uh, while <clears throat> I have a background in child welfare and um, and when- will you remind us what DCF stands for? Department of Children and Families. That's mm-hmm. what the title is here in Florida for them. And um, when I worked for an, an agency, I got training in a protocol called Circle of Security Parenting. And it's an attachment-based parenting uh, course that I teach to families involved with the DCF uh, department. Beautiful. Okay. And um, online family consultations, how do those work? The consultations are primarily families from Florida who don't reside uh, in the same city as I, who will call and say, hey, I need some feedback. This is I'm working with a therapist right now, but they're not maybe an attachment or trauma uh, specialist. So I just need some feedback or assistance on what we could do next. Uh, Sometimes I have parents who will email me all of their documents and I'll review them and give them suggestions on what I think needs to be done or should be done or can be done. Other times it's families who want to do therapy with me, but they can't because they live far away. Uh, And again, this is all within the state of Florida. So when they call in, we'll have a short session of me really listening to what the, what's going on, but then providing them sort of a success plan for them and their child on what to do next and how to search for help in their area. That's a big deal. I mean, when I think when a kid within a family gets stuck and whatever is already going on isn't working, that can just lead to so much hopelessness. And mm-hmm. it matters for anybody who's stuck, but for a kid who's stuck, it matters so much to get things moving in the right direction. So I'm so happy that you're doing yeah. that work. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, with the young kids that I work with, when we think about time, when you're talking about a one-year-old who's going through some some really difficult times because of a certain trauma or because of adoption or 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 whatever it may be, a lot of us think, you know, well, that's a baby. They can't remember. What are they going to do? And, and there are physical things that we look for when we're working with families like these. And when you think about time for a one-year-old, when they go without help for three or four months, that's a quarter of their life. Mm-hmm. So timeliness in this type of work is very, very important. Yeah. And that is, you know, the, the only way that we, when we're thinking, oh, they don't remember, they don't know, we're thinking about verbal memory, but there are so many ways that we store things. Yeah. yeah recent studies have shown that babies remember mm-hmm. through their body remembers. Uh, Van der Kolk, Dr. Van der Kolk is the one who talks about, you know, um, your brain may not, your, your, your visual memory may not remember, but your body will definitely. The, the book called The Body Keeps the Score is something I would suggest every clinician out there reads. Excellent. So with everything you're doing, and it's fantastic that you've got the podcast a little bit more under control, such a good resource, and it's not taking up as much time, but how many sessions a week do you like to have in your practice now? Um, I am very fortunate that I am able to provide um, anywhere from 10 to 15 sessions a week. I try to see my clients on two days a week. So I have the other days available to the podcast, to videos, to to my personal life. So the work-life balance is very important for me. Working in the child welfare setting, the work-life balance was nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're dealing with 40 to 60 cases at a time. And um, it can be very difficult to, to, to get that work-life balance. So when I decided, you know, I'm going to start my own practice, that was a very, very important thing for me. And um, the 10 to 15 clients perfectly fit into my two-day client days. And um, I find enough time to do research and prepare for the sessions on the days that I'm not in office or in session with them. And what's your fee? My fees, um, it, my intake fee is different than my uh, session fee because they spend a little bit more time 
with the families. I charge $150 for the intake and $125 for my regular session. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about your fee? I struggled with this for a while. (laughs) And I think last year was a... um, was a very big growth year for me <clears throat> because I, I surrounded myself with people who were positive, abundant thinkers. So they, they thought in abundance and they allowed me to break free of some of my some of my my fears of but what if I charge this and then no one comes. <laughs> and I think a lot of us when we start out in private practice, we have that fear. How do we survive? And somehow it just falls into place. You just have to keep going and you have to keep, you know, you have to just keep at it and it's going to fall into place. I initially started off with very low fees <clears throat> at um, like $70 per session. And um, when I did a market study on, you know, how much other therapists were charging in my area, not only was I lower than the, the lowest licensed clinician, but I was charging less than some of the registered interns <laughs> and I was a licensed professional. So I with a ton of experience. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I initially increased to a hundred dollars and then to 125. And I am hoping to charge again or, or increase this again next year as I recently increased to 125. So I think we undervalue our work. And when we find our ideal clients, they don't mind paying that because they understand that you will help them and that your time and their time is very important. I totally agree, Selma. I also think there's something, so we're recording this in January and there are all these sales, right? (laughs) Everything's on sale right now. And that doesn't really work for therapy, right? Like I think we can have a tendency to put ourselves on sale when we're feeling insecure, when we're starting out. And it really doesn't work that way for therapy. No. Yeah. No. And you know, when I decided to increase, I I challenged myself and um, I wanted to ask the other clinicians in my area that I trusted how much they charged and what they thought, you know, my price increase would do for my business. And I realized that most of us have money issues. Most of us, uh, a lot of my colleagues would say, well, I didn't go into this field to make money. Yeah. My response to that is, well, you know, medical doctors usually don't go into the field for money. I would hope so. Um, I would hope that they're going into the field to help people, but they're making very good money at it. So what's different between them and us. And I understand that their education is a little bit lengthier than ours is, but it's a different kind of specialty and we're helping people. So just because, you know, help, help doesn't, doesn't need to come free or cheap. If, if, you know, people want help, they'll ask and, and, and pay for it. Yeah. And I think this is true for all therapists. And I'm thinking for your work in particular, if you don't take really good care of yourself, then your work is going to, you're going to have to burn out at some point. So I think part of taking good care of yourself is charging enough. Yes. absolutely. And charging a fee that you are worthy and Mm -hmm. where you won't feel a resentment toward a client. You know, I remember having a session when I initially started off with one of my clients and they came in and they wanted to do a sliding scale with me. So mind you, I was charging really low, but they came in and said, oh, I can't even pay that. Can I pay less? And out of my fear-based thinking, absolutely, you know, why not? We'll figure something out. You need help. I'm here to help. It is what it is. And um, a few sessions into our relationship, into our therapy, they disclosed to me that they were going on a very expensive vacation. So oh, yeah. <laughs> mind, I just, and I didn't catch myself doing this in the session, but something was bothering me the rest of the day. And I called up my supervisor. I still keep supervision and I seek supervision and consultation. And I called him and I said, you know, something about this client is bothering me. I think I need to come in. It's, it's not a very good, good process for me to, to keep this inside. And during my um, supervision, it just came out how 
mad and angry I was at this person for undervaluing me, which that's not what they did. I did this to myself, but I put the blame on them. So um, I had to work through that. And that was my initial, my initial step into the right direction of working on my money issues. Yeah. So smart. I love that you, that you were able to figure out that you needed to talk to your supervisor and get to the bottom of it and not let it fester and not let it get in the way of, you know, future relationships. Such important work. Thank you. Yeah, it is. And, and it's something that unfortunately we don't, we don't address in school. We're just kind of tossed out there and, and figure it out for yourself. And um, it's unfortunate because I think a lot of very good therapists aren't devalue themselves and are stuck in situations where they burn out and eventually just change the field because this is a very, very difficult field to stay in if your boundaries and your your self-care is not on point. Yeah. And there's a there there can be a real dichotomy set up that we're either going to be of service or we're going to be making money. And we 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 sort of learn to look with suspicion on the idea of therapists in private practice making a good living. But I think you're such a good example of this, of how having therapists in private practice who are really dedicated to a high level of service for years and years, you know, setting themselves up to be able to do this for the long haul in these really ethical, small micro businesses where the therapist can make a good living and be in this for the long haul, that that I think that really busts open that dichotomy and proves that it's really false. Yeah. I was excited that this 2017, we were able to travel outside the country with um, some of the profits that I made for myself, working way less than I did at the child welfare agency. I mean, when you compare my quality of life then and now, yes, it gets stressful and, and, it, it wouldn't be fun if it didn't get stressful. But the difference between valuing yourself and knowing how good at you are at what you do, and then having someone else telling you what to do and, and choosing things for you is, is different. And I encourage anyone who is on that bridge of do I do this or do I not just jump in, just do it, just jump in, it's going to be okay. Because if a person like me who has this fear-based mindset <laughs> that she's grown up with, who's got parents uh, f- from the former communist era from Eastern Europe, who believe government jobs are the best types of jobs, and, and breaking through that type of barrier and-, and my own mindset and their mindset, if I could do it, there's no way that other people can. And I, I genuinely, I know this is a cliche, but I genuinely mean that. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. What do you think one of the biggest mindset switches was that you had to make to decide it was okay to be an entrepreneur? I would have to put this on on my husband. Um, he is the one who, as I was debating, what should I do? What should I do? And um, he looked at me and he said, well, you're a child welfare job. That's, we can't do this anymore. This is, this is burning you out. You're not going, you can't do this. So he looked at me and he said, well, what do you have to lose? The worst thing that can happen is you're going to close doors and move on. You're going to find something else. And the, the, he's very simple in his approach to things. And I love that about him. Um, where when, when he put it in those words, I was like, he's absolutely right. What do I have to lose? Nothing. So go on in and, and do this. And, and, and I know it's, it was a little bit easier for me because I had the stability of my husband's paycheck coming in and I didn't have to worry about paying bills. Um, and, and that was a big factor in all of it. But really, the, 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 the freedom that you experience, the exhilaration, the, the, just the satisfaction and the self-care you can do is, is all worth it. Mm. Yeah. So will you help me with a question that came in from a listener that I think you could be really helpful with? Sure. Listener question. Okay. So this person wrote in, 
I have a ton of ideas for my private practice. How do I decide what to do first and how do I avoid getting overwhelmed? Okay. That's a very good question. So I think uh, the way I would approach this is I would probably list out all of those ideas in a piece of paper and then prioritize them. And um, I, I know that this is kind of overkill and we probably hear it all the time from a lot of the coaching and a lot of the, the reading that we do about businesses and, and, and becoming an entrepreneur. Finding that niche, finding your ideal client will eliminate a lot of the stuff that you don't need to do. That's kind of that shiny object in the corner of the room. That's, you know, I have that problem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'll I'll think of a great idea and I'll be like, oh, but that really won't help my clients. So that would be a waste of my time and their time. So prioritizing based on your ideal client's needs. Love that. Yeah. I, I kind of went through this. Uh, I didn't ask the question, but I could have (laughs) at any point when I was doing my end of year review and next year planning, I had so many ideas that I was really excited about of, you know, different ways to serve therapists, different things I wanted to do for them. And I ended up crossing off almost every single new idea because it's really important for me to prioritize. It's really important for me to simplify, spend time with my family. And so one of the things that helped me know what to cross off and what to leave on was, you know, what are the things that are really directly leading me to the business that I want right now and to helping the people I want to help right now and weeding everything else out, at least for now, yeah. knowing it can, you know, we can do it later. There was a really good book by Keller who wrote, um, or is it Keller Williams? One of, one of those, um, who wrote the book called The One Thing. Are you familiar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, they talk about, and I heard this from another podcast uh, probably about a year and a half ago, who said, you know, become excellent at one thing, mm-hmm. one thing only, and then the other things will fall in place. You need to build that trustworthy relationship with your ideal client because they're not going to come and buy from what you're selling if they don't know who you are and they don't believe that you can really help them. So becoming really good at that one thing is very, very important. Yeah. And I'm thinking for you, at least from the outside, it looks like you doing the podcast is one really clear way for you to keep on reaching and building those relationships and building that trust over time that I'm sure you do other things as well, but that it's not necessary to do a thousand things or a hundred things to, to market your practice. My, my business plan shifted so much over the last year um, and working on it this year has, it, it went from like a, 30 page thing to like a almost 10 item thing. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. And just keeping it simple, keeping it sweet and simple because if I am overwhelmed and I am confused, I can't send out a clear message to my clients. I can't send out a clear message to my ideal population. So keeping it very simple for myself to keep it simple for them. And we have to remember that just because we know a lot about a specific topic we have to dial it back to literally novice level for our clients when they're listening to us and keeping the language very simple, keeping the language that they're using. And I struggled with that for some time and, and um, really talking to my family, I sat them down one day and I said, okay, I'm going to describe what I do and tell me if it makes sense. And there were 10 of them. And after I finished my spiel, my, my elevator pitch, um, They looked at me and every one of them gave me a different answer. And I was like, elevator pitch is terrible. I need to (laughs) fix this. (laughs) So we sat around and um, really brainstormed ways on on what I could say. And and they were like, well, we all understand what attachment and trauma is. We all get that. Why do you have to do like anything else? We understand what that is. And, And these are people with different educational backgrounds. And um, they're the ones who kind of said, okay, this is what you need to focus on. This is what what you are most passionate about and just focus on that and it will be okay. And um, over the past year, I think it's done wonders for me. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And so you've really simplified, narrowed in, and just claimed this one area, yeah, which is brilliant. And on really a 10 item list to take it down to a three item list, because if I can really get good at three things, mm -hmm. hopefully by the year after that, get really good at one thing. That's really all I need to focus on. Yeah. So if you could time travel to the beginning of your private practice, what would you tell the Selma of that time? Work on your fear-based thinking. Run, um, run your business out of love and not out of fear, and you'll be okay. You'll be more than okay. Mm, so great. So Selma, what is the very best place for people to find you and throw compliments at you? I would say <clears throat> my website, hopeandhealingcenter.com, as well as um, my Facebook page, uh, which is linked to the um, website. So if you logged on there, you'd be able to find me. And then, of course, my podcast, the Parent-Child Relationship Podcast, uh, which I'm working on new episodes, so I'm excited about that. Excellent. Selma, this has been such a delight. Thank you so much Thank for, for sharing your story. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Therapist Clubhouse. If you are building your private practice, you'll want to check out the help we have to offer you over at coachingwithannie.com. We help therapists create profitable and fulfilling businesses, and we would love to help you too. Head over to coachingwithannie.com. I'll see you next week. Sure. And I feel so weird looking at myself now. I record my own podcast as well. So I am literally always talking into the mic. Yeah. So looking at myself now, it's being in the, in the interviewee seat is a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. You look so pro. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs>